Hey everyone, how you doing? Welcome to the channel. I wanted today to give you a few slightly older fantasy recommendations. So all of these are going to be titles that were released before the turn of the century. So I've been reading fantasy for something like 30 years and some of the older titles that I've read I like to think of as classic fantasy. By definition, well first of all the definition of classic fantasy is maybe a bit vague, it depends on where you're looking and who you're asking, um, but I've seen sources define classic fantasy as anything from before say 1945. Anything after that point is modern fantasy. Personally, I disagree with that, and a lot of what I consider to be classic fantasy are from kind of my formative years, I guess. We're talking the late 80s and the 90s, so that's kind of the range that I'm looking at today, bringing you eight fantasy titles that I've really enjoyed that were all released in the 1980s and the 1990s. For the most part, these are going to be the sort of titles that don't tend to get too much traction on BookTube. So we am going to miss out some titles that do fall into this kind of date range, including the early books in the Song of Ice and Fire and the Wheel of Time series. Uh, titles as well like Robin Hobbs Farseer, because they do get plenty of mentions on various BookTube channels. Most of these ones, although they're not necessarily going to be brand new titles to you, you might not have seen too much talk about them on YouTube. So I am going to start off with the earliest and that one is a 1982 release which is Magician by Raymond D. Feist. I've got the bind up here which is beautifully sun-worn. You can see the difference in colour there on the spine. Uh, but this one is the first two books. Uh, you do sometimes get them, especially in the US, as Magician Apprentice and, and Magician Master I believe they were titled. Uh, but this one is the all-in-one volume. I really had a great time with this and it's the start of an epic sprawling series where if you look at just the series that this one kind of fits in, you've got the Rift War Saga, you've then also got several other series that make up the Rift War Cycle and there's about 30 odd books all told in that Rift War Cycle. So this is a trilogy, if you include this as one book, you've then got Silverthorn and A Darkness at Sephanon to round out the Rift War trilogy. But it introduces you to some of the characters who you'll see throughout most of those books in the Rift War Cycle, first and foremost being Pug the Great Magician. And it's kind of his origin story, it tells you the story of his early days where he's a young boy with his friend Thomas, and it takes you through the journey of both of those characters and shows you how they come into various powers and how they become really important, really great characters in the development of this world. I love the world building in here, obviously with 30 odd books you've got a big expansive world and I really do like the world of Midkemia. You do also see another world as well which is called Kalawan and there's some uh, kind of alien if you like invaders who serve as one of the main catalysts of this particular story. But there's a great story overall, some great characters, I had a really really good time with it. And it's a really good time to be reading this as well because the first two, if you like, series in this uh, Rift War cycle have been optioned for TV and there is a show that's being worked on. So that's this particular trilogy, the Rift War Saga, and you've got a trilogy co-written with Jenny Wirtz uh, called the Empire series. And that one features predominantly at least a different range of characters set on that other world of Color One, and it's very much a political fantasy, whereas this one is more the kind of epic classic fantasy feel. Either way, it's a series that I really had a great time reading, and the initial trilogy and the four book series that come kind of next, which is the Serpent War Saga, they did collectively form one of the entries in my top 10 fantasy series list because I really, really loved them. Moving on to 1984, and we've got Legend by David Gemmell. This is the debut novel by the author, and he wrote lots of books in this series, the Draenei Saga as well. He's got various other titles outside of the Draenei Saga, but it's the Draenei for me that really stands out for David Gemmell's writing. Uh, I've seen him in various places referred to as a father of Grimdark. The books themselves, the Draenei Saga, I wouldn't call them Grimdark by any sense, but you can definitely see his influence on many of today's writers and in many of today's 
grimdark stories. I really enjoyed this particular story which is kind of a bit of an odd one in a sense because you focus on the end of someone's career essentially. You've got the legendary warrior Druss and he's a guy who you often see on different covers, not this one, with a great big butterfly bladed battle axe snaga and he's one of the great fantasy characters. But as I say it's a little bit of an odd one maybe because we start off in this book, kind of at the end of his career. There are other books later on in the Draenei saga which kind of go back a little bit and give you Druss's legend itself. It tells you about his younger years. So we do have the Chronicles of Druss the Legend, Death Walker, and so forth. So you can find earlier stories if you really enjoy the character as I did as well. In here though, Druss is called to action to defend Dross Dalnok, the great kind of impenetrable fortress of the Draenei, and uh, there's an invading horde and you go through basically this great battle, this siege of Dross Dalnok with its, uh, I think it's six walls to this fortress that they have to defend. And it's a really good story with some great characters, but the one that stands out is of course the main man himself, Druss the Legend, who gives his name to the title. And it is for me, as well as being a personal favourite, one of the all-time classics of epic fantasy. Talking of classic characters, we've next got the Crystal Shard by Ore Salvatore. This is the first book in terms of uh, publication featuring the legendary character Drizzta Worden the Dark Elf Ranger. Um, there are a few books which come before this in the chronology. There's the Dark Elf Trilogy, which is his origin story. Uh, I think the titles are Homeland, Sojourn and Exile, if I remember correctly, and that's a great read in itself as well. Uh, but this one really introduces the characters who you'll see with Dritz throughout uh, many of his stories. So you've got his companions, the companions of the hall, so some of those are on the cover here. You've got the Barbarian Wolfgar, the Dwarven Lord or Dwarven King, Bruna Battlehammer, his uh, human adopted daughter, Catty Bree. You've got the Halfling, Regis as well. Uh, but this is the story, the first part of the Icewind Dale trilogy that really introduces all of those and introduces us indeed to the world that R.A. Salvatore uh, created or expanded upon within the Forgotten Realms. I really enjoy stories with a great bunch of characters, what people often term the found family, and this is kind of the first family of the found family trope as far as I'm concerned because they have so many uh, real epic adventures over a long period of time because many of them are long lived through either magical means or just because of the, uh, the race that they are. Uh, is generally long-lived. So you do get lots of adventures, it's real swashbuckling stuff with a good mix of essentially sword and sorcery. And like the previous two titles, if you enjoy this one, there are so many more adventures where you can follow some or all of the characters that you'll meet here. Staying in 1988, we've got The Deed of Paxenarian by Elizabeth Moon. I've got the bind up here, the trilogy. Uh, the first book in the series, which was released in 1988, was Sheep Farmer's Daughter. And uh, this one, like Icewind Dale, there are books which are set earlier, I think. The trilogy that makes up The Deed of Paxenarian I've got here, uh, I think they do form books three to five of the Paxenarian chronology or the overall story chronology. Uh, so there are some earlier books where you can get a bit more backstory, a bit more history of the world and maybe some of the characters. I can't talk too much on those because I haven't actually read those earlier books in the chronology as yet. But this one I really enjoyed and it is again a bit of an origin story. It does tell you about the beginnings of Paxenarian, how she went from the essentially the sheep farmer's daughter of the title of the first book to the paladin and the great warrior that you can see on the cover of this bind up. I really had a good time reading this. The writing was so accessible and just flowed even though this one is I think it's 1205 pages from memory, it flew by because it was such a good story, such good writing, and a really good and interesting character who I really enjoyed. You do have paladins in here, so you've got a good mix of kind of uh, epic fantasy with battle scenes and castle sieges and attacks and things like that, but you've also got the religious warrior side of things as well with those paladins, and I think there's a good mix between the two of them of the kind of the mystical, the magical, and the uh, kind of God-given powers, if you like, that the Paladins have. So it's a really good read for me. I do want to get back to this world, actually, at some point, because I do have another book in this series on my shelf that I haven't got round to as yet. 
And then from 1989, we've got a book that I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for because it's one of the books that really got me into reading fantasy. This is Blue Moon Rising by Simon R. Green, which is the first book in his Forest Kingdom world. There's several other titles available in this world as well. So again, like many of these, it's essentially the start of a series. You can continue the journey, learning more about the world and various other characters who you meet within. So this one focuses on Prince Rupert, who is the second son, is the spare, if you like. He's not really needed. He's sent out on essentially an impossible quest to rescue a princess from a dragon, and he ends up doing that despite everyone thinking that he's going to die, he's going to get killed by the dragon. He ends up befriending the dragon and returning with the princess and the dragon. And he's also got a unicorn steed as well, so you've got both the dragon and a unicorn, both of whom are characters in their own right. So you do get a lot of good banter and a lot of good back and forth between especially those three, the unicorn, the dragon and Prince Rupert. But Princess Julia is also a good character with a real sassy nature and the adventures that they go through both together and separately I thought were really intriguing. There's some good light versus dark themes in this book with the main antagonist being a demon king and you've got plenty of humour in here as well. So this one was a really good book for me. There's some other good titles within this series as well if you do enjoy it and you want to carry on. And then skipping from the end of the 80s to the end of the 90s, 1998 gives us Green Rider by Kristen Britton. This is the first book in the series of the same name. And this one is another one that's just got a really interesting story that I had a good time reading. We start off with a young lady called Kerrigan and she comes across in the forest a dying man, a king's messenger, who's got a very important message. And this dying man belongs to a group of kind of legendary messengers, the Green Riders. And he asks Kerrigan to take his horse and deliver the message to the king to complete his mission, essentially. So the reason he's dying is because someone attacked him and they're after the message that Carrigan has now got in her possession. So she's a wanted woman, she's been chased down, she's got to deliver this message and essentially become a green rider herself. I really enjoyed some of the magic that you get in this series. I think Carrigan is a good and interesting character as well. And it's another one where there's a good few books, I think there's seven or eight in this series, if you enjoy it and you want to carry on and learn more about the Green Riders as an organisation, but primarily about Kerrigan and her journey through that organisation and how she rises and becomes such an important character for this world in general. And then to round us out, I've got two titles from 1999, the first of which is Dawn Thief by James Barclay. This is the first book in the Chronicles of the Raven trilogy. There's a follow-up trilogy focusing on these characters as well, and they are the Raven, this mercenary band. You've got a good mix of characters in there with warriors and mages, and that gives it a real kind of sword and sorcery classic fantasy feel. Dawn Thief itself is the name of a spell, and it's the sort of spell that will break the world essentially, but has to be cast. And this is a story about this legendary band of mercenaries who are faced with that decision of whether to cast or not cast this spell. It's one of my favourite uh, sort of never really seen, never spoken about series. I had such a good time reading about the Unknown Warrior and his band, and it's another one of those with that classic writing style where the pages just turn really quickly because there's such intensity to the story. So this one is a great start to the series. I did enjoy the series overall, but the first book, Dawn Thief, was definitely the standout one for me. And then finally, one that's a little bit different to uh, still a lot of the books that we see today. This is Orcs First Blood, and the first title in the series is Bodyguard of Lightning. And the reason it's a bit different, especially for the day it was written, is because uh, the characters aren't human. So as you can see on the cover there, and from the title I suppose as well, uh, you've got a band of orcs, and there's a dwarf in there as well. And we follow this band of orcs, it's another mercenary group essentially, uh, within the overall kind of orcish army and it's a really interesting story humans are the bad guys essentially in here they are destroying the world essentially that the orcs live in and you've got the orcs fighting back and this band of warriors trying to uh, keep magic alive essentially because with humans taking over their world magic itself is dying there's some really good elements to this one, some really good battle scenes in it as well. It's another one where it's got maybe a bit of a simpler writing style to a lot of what you might call the classic fantasy, uh, but that does mean that it flows really easily and it's very easily accessible to readers who are more familiar with today's style of writing. I really enjoyed this series as a whole and they are pretty short, they're about 300 or so pages each for the three books 
in this particular trilogy so as well as being really good with some cool characters in it it doesn't take too long to get through them as well so those are some of the older fantasy stories that I've got in my collection and that I really enjoyed and still stick in my head uh, compared to some of the more modern fantasy titles that we see all the time today. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these and what you've thought of them and if you've got any similar recommendations from the 80s, 90s or maybe even earlier that you think my other viewers might be interested in. I'll hopefully catch you again in another video sometime soon but until then as always take care of yourselves, read some good books. Bye for now.